Welcome to the Old Garage number 19. I'm Wild Bill, and we've got some questions, a little bit of silliness, and a shout-out, so let's get some questions going. First one here I have is from Gabriel F., and it's uh, regarding the brake special. It says, great special on brakes. Thank you. Other than asbestos, which was an industry standard for brake pads long past the vintage era, what other materials were tried as brake pads? Uh, what materials did they use in brake bands and transmission brands? It doesn't sound like they last very long. Well, you're right, they didn't. That was part of the issue. Uh, initially, you would get uh, copper, uh, brass, stainless steel being used for bands. Uh, you would also see uh, various cloth, linen, canvas, also various different types of leather. Uh, cow leather, horse leather, goat leather, you name it. Uh, they, they tried lots of different stuff uh, before asbestos, and, and that was the problem, is that they just didn't last very long. Uh, which is why you saw a lot of external brakes and a lot of banding that uh, could be accessed from the vehicle without too much difficulty because if it's too far internal and they're a constant wear item, it's just going to make the maintenance of the car that much more difficult. So your, uh, those type of bands that before the asbestos days, uh, they were going to be fairly easy to get off and on and they were known to be uh, points of wear. Uh, spe especially the ones that were using canvas and cloth. The, they also tended to catch fire a lot too. <laughs> but the, uh, the metal ones actually did as well. You'd be surprised uh, that uh, once you have, you know, like uh, some of the early drum brakes and also some of the earlier transmission bands that were made of stainless steel, uh, you get steel hot enough, it's going to get brittle and snap and catch fire and catch everything else around it on fire. And so that's, which is, again, why they didn't uh, last as long and why they weren't in uh, use uh, much past uh, about the 19, about 1910 or so. Uh, unless you're talking about a Model T's bands, but even those were hybrid bands too and often did use asbestos as well. So that's a uh, question. Uh, another one also from Gabriel um, asking about, uh, a question about gauges. Uh, how many vintage cars had tachometers? It, uh, come and gone and come again is pretty standard equipment, but what about the early years? Well, tachometers have actually been around since the 1840s. Uh, they were first designed for uh, locomotives, but you didn't really see tachometers being uh, put on cars all that often in the early era, mostly because of the type of engines that were used. Uh, you, although you had a di di very various variety of uh, different engines, uh, but the T-head was the most common, and uh, T-heads um, are slow revving engines as it is, and so what many manufacturers would do, as opposed to installing a tachometer, would install a governor on the engine to keep it from over revving. Um, but tachometers, I mean, like the first Benz cars didn't have them, the first Daimlers didn't have them. You did start seeing them in race cars, uh, like the Panhard and Levisors and the Peugeots and the Moors of, uh, uh, of the 1890s. But as far as a tachometer on a, uh, you know, a non-race car, they were pretty rare and didn't come into play unless it was a sports car of some sort. And uh, then I have a question here from Gasolini. Uh, he says, uh, when did police start using cars and when was the first police car chase? In particular, the first car to car chase. Uh, what were the cars and who won? Um, well, we're way past the vintage era for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, police departments did get cars, you know, prior to World War One. I. I know that uh, in Ohio, uh, there was a police uh, department that uh, got an electric van uh, in 1899. But this was a vehicle that was used for uh, basically picking up drunks and wasn't being used for police car chases, so to speak. Uh, in fact, when cars did start getting used by police forces, the idea of having to chase another car or another vehicle wasn't really on the uh, on the table because uh, the idea of it uh, wasn't really there. It hadn't there weren't enough criminals with cars <laughs> to uh, 
you know, cause you to have to hunt them down. Now, they did use cars prior to World War I in large urban areas where they could uh, put a radio in the car and be able to uh, communicate via radio. Uh, that was common. And as far as uh, police vehicles to go and actually chase criminals, uh, those were initially motorcycles because your first criminals that you have to chase down were either on foot or horseback, and so police were either on foot or on horseback or started getting motorcycles. It wasn't really until after World War I that you start seeing police cars that we would actually, as we would know them today, and the, the first ones were just simply um, a regular car that was just uh, painted police on it. You know, Model T's were used, you know, Ford Model T's were used a lot for this. Um, also, Humbers were used, and Vauxhalls in England. Uh, you know, you had a lot of uh, Peugeots and uh, being police cars, Renaults as police cars, Fiats as police cars, and, and they were just standard models. As far as the first, you know, police chase car to car, oh, it, I really don't know, I'll be quite honest, because uh, y it's not going to be something that's going to happen until the 30s, at least, uh, until you're going to have, you know, criminals with cars uh, being chased by police in cars, it, it, because it just didn't, there weren't enough cars and there wasn't uh, enough of an issue. So, Sorry, kind of a weak answer, I suppose, but uh, I don't know who did the first car-to-car -car chase. I don't know who won. Um, you know, that's, it doesn't become a, a thing until actually the 1940s and 50s, where, where you have that kind of an issue. Okay, I had a question from uh, Bigaboo, and uh, he says that he's uh, building a close replica of a 1903 Franklin. Cool car. Hey, air power. Gotta love it. Air-cooled engine. Nice, nice cars. I had no idea as I began building this automobile that in those early days of automobile building that the rear axle, even at that time, had a differential that allows the rear wheels uh, in a turn uh, turn independently around a corner. I corrected my rear end by placing bearings on one side, even though I own a rear axle from an 04 Cadillac that has a differential, and still have no idea what makes it work. If at all possible, could you someday you know, on an episode explain how these early automobiles had differentials? Differential started uh, before the car again. Uh, the first differentials were used in clock making and watch making because where you have a single source of power going in through a shaft into a mechanism where you have outputs, multiple outputs spinning at different speed requirements, you're going to need to have some sort of mechanism to be able to control those speeds of the different shafts. And there's two basic types of differentials that you'll see, uh, that being the um, planetary uh, type of differential and also the spur gear type of differential. Uh, now the planetary is also called the epicyclic, uh, and basically just a different term for the same thing. And this is where you have a main gear that drives a series of other gears or ring gears and what they'll have the planet gears so that you can have a single power source and have either different outputs or single output or varied outputs uh, to the rear. The earliest cars had them, and you know, all the way from the beginning. The uh, for cars that didn't have differentials were those that had a single wheel driving to the ground. Uh, not as common on four-wheeled vehicles. Usually if you're going to have a four-wheeled vehicle with the rear wheels being driven, there's going to be a differential. Sometimes though, uh, there may only be one uh, wheel to the rear being driven, in which case there's no going to be a differential on it. But where of course you do have two wheels being driven, now you have to be able to make sure that they can operate at different speeds to allow the vehicle to turn effectively. Now they don't have to be in the center. When we think of differentials today or you know cars, you think of them in the center of the axle. Not necessarily so. Uh, if you have a vehicle, particularly a chain driven vehicle with only one chain driving the axle, you'll have a differential on it off to the side where the chain is. Or if you have a transverse engine, which did happen, uh, <laughs> you would, well, it would often require the uh, differential to be on one side. 
And then, of course, you have the invention of all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive and having differentials in different places. So we'll probably talk about that in more detail. Uh, but also, there's some more information on differentials in the, uh, the special, the VC8 special uh, power to the ground talks about them, as well as transaxles, which you'll run into, you know, right at the turn of the uh, 20th century. So, yeah, differentials. It's fun stuff. Okay, a uh, question from uh, Zippy to Strange. He says, I wonder if from a user repair perspective, if chains are not better as far as cost and repair goes. If they are covered, they last a long while. For light sedans, compacts, trucks, it's plausible, but highway 50 miles per hour may wear them out faster. And, well, chains obviously can handle highway speeds. I mean, there are and still are used on motorcycles. Uh, it's a question of two things. Uh, one is weight. Uh, you know, if you have, you know, the biggest, hugest motorcycle and you're one of the biggest people to ride a motorcycle, probably the combined weight of both you and the vehicle is going to be under 900 pounds. And so you still, of course, need a stout chain to move that, but the amount of stress that's going onto that chain is a whole lot less than if you're trying to move a vehicle that weighs closer to two tons. So that is one issue. Another issue is weight. See, a drive shaft in, with its differential is going to weigh a whole lot less than a chain is because the chain is still going to need a differential and the chain isn't hollow. So therefore, the drive shaft being basically a hollow tube with only two moving parts on it, which are a universal joint on one side and the other, is a quarter of the weight of an equivalent chain and a chain of a size that would be needed to handle the stress of keeping them that much weight moving. Another issue actually is the reliability because one thing to remember about machines is that the more moving parts you have the more likely something is going to break and chains have lots of moving parts and so when you have a very big heavy chain that is not only generating a lot of heat okay but a lot of stress and then you have all these little different pins and links in there there's a whole lot more to break whereas the drive shaft you've only got two moving parts to break so even though yes a chain is perfectly safe to use and you can put covers on them and chain guards etc so that if something did break you know no one's going to get hurt but when you have a chain that now weighs 150 some pounds and it breaks you're going to have to be a pretty strong individual to be able to rechain that vehicle and to fix that so that's you know once you get to that kind of weight it's just diminishing returns. It just doesn't make sense to uh, use a chain. Okay, and we've got one more question here. And the uh, question is, uh, did the rich and powerful tend to drive themselves or tend to have a chauffeur? I'm aware of both happening. So was it a matter of personal preference uh, or, and circumstance? You know, uh, when it comes to, you know, prior to World War I, if you bought a car, then you were either driving it yourself you were having it chauffeured or you were buying it to be a chauffeur or taxi driver. Now, if you were a wealthy person, a lord, lady, or a mogul of industry, then whether or not you had a chauffeur had really everything to do with what car you bought. Because if you bought, you know, a big luxury car at that time, it would already be designed for a chauffeur and would most likely be chauffeur driven. However, if you, being more of a sportsman type of noble, and wanted to drive yourself, you simply wouldn't buy a luxury car for that purpose. You would buy a sports car for that purpose. So, typically, in those days, the rich and famous, if they wanted to drive, they would buy a sports car, and when they wanted to be driven, they had a different car for that purpose. So, that's, uh, that's how that went. Well, I'm going to tell you all that for silliness today, because that's all the questions, didn't have a whole lot, I thought I'd introduce you to the five cats. You've all met these guys, okay, you know, so I mean, there's Tetsuzo, you know, there's Latimer, there's Ridley, there's uh, uh, Hoover right there, where's Kirby, okay, Kirby's on the back, so you all met them, so I'm going to let you meet my five cats. Now this guy is a Trump Nazi lion squirrel. Yes, aren't you? This is Donuts. He is the worst animal on the planet. Right, Donuts? Yep. Now this over here is Jack. 
Now he's the, uh, he's a, he's a, well, let's see, Jack, he's a, got a dirty nose, raccoon tail, a wombat spine, rabbit whiskers, walrus, uh, a rabbit racy. See, a dirty nose, uh, raccoon tail, wombat spine, rabbit feet, walrus whiskers, panda skin, soft taco innards. He's not a real cat, but he's a fuzzy buddy. Yeah, fuzzy buddy. King in the, lurking in the dark, we have Sambuca. Hello, Sam. Meow. 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 What do you think, Sam? He's just little, huh? Meow. Meow. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, checking in on you there. Now, this is Bo. Now, Bo here, he's like a kitty, except he's gray. And he doesn't have cat paws. He has kitty foots. See, these these are actually kitty foots. Yeah, that's a bow. And he's gray. And he's adopted. Yeah, so, he's gray. All right, Francis. Francis, now this is a fuzzy cross-eyed toasted stay puffed marshmallow brute spaz. Right, Francis? Are you going to spaz? Are you going to do anything? Or are you just going to go squeak? Okay, well, that's a Francis. So, yeah, that's a total of 10 animals we have in here, plus the uh, myself and my wife, which makes 11 animals. You'll get it. I'm the bad one. I'm the bad one. But I uh, definitely want to do a shout-out, because there is a cool channel out there. This guy's got his farm somewhere in the U.S., and, uh, and amongst other things, he recently found a Model A Ford that literally was yard art. Basically, an old piece of rust stuck on somebody's property and left there just to be pretty. And he, this guy's actually uh, getting her running again. It's crazy. But it's Rotter's Garage. And, yeah, there's a lot of rust <laughs> on the stuff that he deals with. But the thing is, is that he's very thorough. And he goes over what he's doing to, you know, communicates with uh, folks saying, hey, I got some ideas, what ideas do you have? And he really shows you what's going on with the cars, what he runs into, and it's a great channel. And, you know, when he posts up something, grab some popcorn and just kick back because you're going to enjoy it. So, but anyway, uh, short and sweet today, that's what we had for the old garage, and I hope you all had a great Christmas, and which has already happened by the time this comes up, and, of course, the new year, which is going to happen in the future. Woo hoo that's I I, lo I love being able to talk in the future. It's amazing electronically. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on the old garage. Peace.